the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Some of you will remember, and for some of you it's going back a little too far, but uh, in 1963 there was a television show that began, Let's Make a Deal. It became one of the most popular shows uh, of its type. Contestants would, would dress up in these flamboyant costumes and host Monty Hall asked them to choose between this prize they could see and what was behind the door or in a box or whatever it was. And sure enough, they had one thing and would they trade it with something else and make a great deal? Well, sometimes they did, and it was really impressive. But other times, well, they got what was called a zonk, and that was the end of it. They went home sad. We have a little fun with that sort of thing, but it was nothing funny about the let's make a deal that Judas proposed to the chief priests in our text today. It's really a, a sad and somber account of Judas Iscariot's making a deal. A significant deal, though, a deal to betray Jesus. But Judas's significant deal was far more significant than he would ever imagine. Well, it begins on Holy Week's Wednesday night. By now, the chief priests and the scribes won in the worst way to arrest Jesus and kill him. He was a threat to the power and prestige of those religious authorities. He was also a threat over their control over the people. And you know, he had made them look bad publicly on public occasions several times. They tried to trap him in a discussion on one or more occasion and well, Jesus always bested them time and again he would ask them questions, you see, and either they didn't know the answer or they really didn't want to say what the answer was. And so, in the minds of the chief priests and scribes, Judas was, uh, Jesus was also dangerous. In their mind, he was dangerous uh, in that he didn't really seem to be concerned about whether he was doing work or not on the Sabbath as they defined it. And he even associated and ate with those wrong kind of people, you know, the tax collectors and the public sinners. He simply wasn't acting and looking like the Messiah should look and act, at least as they had estimated he would. In their mind, Jesus had become way too popular with the people and they witnessed what happened on Palm Sunday. Jesus entered Jerusalem accompanied by the crowds yelling, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So great was the outpouring of Jesus from that great crowd of people that the Pharisees who saw it concluded, Look, the world has gone after him. And it was the popularity of Jesus with the crowds that caused the chief priests and scribes to hold off arresting and, and killing him because, well, they, they feared a violent backlash from the crowds if they tried to take Jesus away while he was out in public. And so they needed help, help in an evil scheme, a way to get to Jesus quietly and discreetly. And so naturally they rejoiced when Judas showed up, gave, gave them exactly what they were looking for, what they thought they needed. Satan had entered Judas, and Jews conferred with the chief priests and the temple guard on just what he might do to betray Jesus to them. And all his plans came to fruition just 24 hours later, that next evening, Monday, Thursday, Judas would leave the upper room and go to the chief priests. He would lead the temple guard then to Jesus as Jesus and the disciples were in the Garden of Gethsemane, across the valley on the Mount of Olives, away from the crowds of people. 
And in that ultimate act of betrayal, Judas would walk up to Jesus and identify him to the temple guard with a kiss. Apparently, they didn't even know what he looked like. Fact is, this wasn't the first time that Judas had betrayed Jesus or the other disciples, for that matter. We read in John chapter 12, when Jesus is eating at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, Mary anoints Jesus' feet with expensive ointment. And Judas objects that this is a waste for this expensive ointment. He argued that the oil could have been sold and, and given to the poor. Yeah, but John, the evangelist, also tells us that Judas wasn't concerned at all about the poor. He happened to be the treasurer of the disciples and used to steal from the treasury. He wanted more money in the treasury so that he could have more money at his own disposal. Here's the point. He had already made a significant deal with his own conscience to justify his continued betrayal of Jesus and the other disciples. This new significant deal just involved some other people. It was still an ongoing thing for Judas. Now, while Judas's name has become synonymous with betrayal, Judas is far from the only one who has betrayed Jesus. In fact, we all can identify with Judas. We just have uh, a different price. It isn't 30 pieces of silver, but it might be some momentary pleasure when we see a certain image on the computer screen. It might be that self-importance we feel when we're in the center of attention as we gossip about a friend. It might be the lack of sorrow and empathy, and maybe even some secret feelings of joy that we feel as someone else falters and we feel superior. You see, we daily betray Jesus, not with a kiss, but with our thoughts, our words, and our deeds that are self-centered and self-serving. We cannot love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. We cannot love our neighbor as ourselves if we put ourselves first. And we do that all the time. We, who are people who believe in and confess Jesus as our Lord. We've each made significant deals with our consciences just to let this or that slide a little. Judas had his price, and so did each one of us. Although he didn't know it, the betrayal by G Judas and the events that would follow were going to be used by God to bring about what Judas could never imagine. The deal God made even before he made people able to turn against him was that he was going to enter history knowing what was going to transpire, what had to transpire. It would not be a deal made for 30 pieces of silver, but rather the holy, precious blood and innocent suffering and death of Jesus that had to be there as payment for all sins, for all people, for all time. And he used Judas's significant deal as part of the plan. Because of God's great love, grace, and mercy, Christ could not, would not betray you. He would not betray the will of the Father. He would, however, voluntarily shed his blood and offer his life as payment in full for your sin and my sin. And just as he predicted on one than, more than one occasion, he would also rise again on the third day. And now, Jesus will still never, ever betray you. He promises to be with you always, even to the end of the age. He promises 
never to leave you or forsake you. Even today, he's interceding for you, speaking on your behalf in the presence of the Father. And just as he promised, he will return on the last day and raise up you and all believers and grant to you and all believers never-ending life in his presence. The significant deal that Judas made with the religious leaders of the day set in motion the events that God would use to change everything between God and man. Satan, Judas, and the religious leaders would use this deal with an evil intent. God would use it according to his love and compassion for you and for all people. It was all in accord with his plan, all in accord with his timetable, all in accord with his will, all in accord with his great love for you. In Jesus' name, amen.